In 1957, the Navy was honored to play host to President Dwight D. Eisenhower on three occasions. The first was a leisurely cruise from Norfolk down to the warm Bahamas and from there to Bermuda for his historic conference with British Prime Minister Macmillan. On March 15th, the USS Canberra steamed through quiet seas about 150 miles off Wilmington, North Carolina. The President had come aboard the night before in Norfolk with his official party, Major General Harold Snyder, James C. Haggerty, Captain E.P. Oran, USN, the President's naval aide. A demonstration of carrier firings was arranged for the President. After viewing motion pictures to demonstrate principles of the shoot, the President went to air defense aft to watch. Two missiles were launched in quick succession. The second missile exploded just after booster separation. The first one rode the beam, and the influence fuse functioned about 40 feet from the target, well within lethal range. The drone immediately went out of control and fell into the sea. The familiar golf bag, inscribed with the famous signature Dwight D. Eisenhower, was not left behind in Washington, for the President's portable driving range had been shipped ahead and set up on the deck of the Canberra. The ideally warm weather provided the president with many opportunities to get in some good practice during the five-day cruise. Off Little Cat Island, the president, Dr. Snyder, and Captain Orand left the ship in the gig to do some trolling and at the same time have a close look at Little Cat Island. A walkie-talkie was brought along for communication with the follow-up boats during the trip. The ship's motorboat took station ahead and the motor launched astern. It wasn't long before Captain Oran had a strike. It turned out to be a seven pound barracuda. The president reeled in in order not to foul the captain's line. This turned out to be the only catch, so the party soon returned to the Canberra. On Tuesday, 19 March, an air demonstration was scheduled for the president. Participating in the show were F-2H Banshees and AD Sky Raiders. One of the destroyers streamed a towing spar about 2,000 feet astern, and the plane strafed, rocketed, and bombed the spar. Finally, there was a flyby of 10 propeller-driven aircraft, spelling out 17, the number of the air group. There were many opportunities for just relaxing and sunny. The weather was ideally warm. Air temperature, 75 degrees. The sea temperature, 78 degrees. About 3 o'clock on 19 March, the Canberra hove to off Albury Point, Bermuda, and the president prepared to depart the ship. One evening at happy hour, the president addressed Captain Morrow and his crew, saying, Captain Morrow, <laughs> men on these rival ships, I'm sure I will not have another opportunity like this to speak to so many of you all at one time. On behalf of my party and myself, I want to thank you for all the courtesies you've shown us. We know that uh, this trip down here has probably put extra duty on all of you. We're appreciative of it. We thank you very sincerely. And particularly for all of those people who took part in this show this evening. I thank all of you. Good night, good luck. An accident to the steering control of the barge required the presidential party to transfer to the captain's gig. The president, however, took the matter good-naturedly, sending a message to the barge crew, telling them that he appreciated the fact that accidents will happen, and that this was just a little salt and pepper on the dish. At four o'clock, the president and his party arrived at Albury Point, Hamilton, Bermuda. On hand to greet him were Prime Minister Harold McMillan, Governor Woodall of Bermuda, and other dignitaries. After a review of the troops, the president retired to his quarters to prepare for conferences which followed. Three months later, the president, with members of his cabinet and defense officials, went to sea again with the Navy to observe attack carrier operations. On June 6, the presidential plane Columbine landed at the Naval Auxiliary Air Station, Mayport, Florida, with the president and his party aboard. 
Waiting to greet the president were Admiral Arlie Burke, Admiral Gerald Wright, and Captain R.B. Moore. The Columbine taxied up to the dock where the USS Saratoga was tied up portside too. Aboard the Columbine were Dr. Snyder, Mr. Haggerty, Secretary John Foster Dulles, Mr. George Humphrey, Admiral Lewis L. Straws, Mr. Arthur Larson, Mr. Meyer Kestenbaum, Dr. Gabriel Hauge, Major John Eisenhower, and Captain Dale Crittenberger, United States Army. The Secretary of the Navy, Thomas S. Gates, and his party had arrived just before the Columbine landed. Included in the Secretary's party were Mr. Charles E. Wilson, Mr. Percival Brundage, Mr. Gordon Gray, General Person, and General Goodpaster, United States Army. The Saratoga got underway at 10.50 and entered international waters at 11.10 at a speed of 20 knots. The President was briefed by Secretary Gates and Admiral Burke on the two-day operation of the Saratoga and the concepts of carrier air warfare. After lunch, the Saratoga commenced launching aircraft. First to go were F-3H Demons and F-4D Sky Rays. The President watched from flag plot. He saw an F-4D Sky Ray take a wave off, pouring on the power as it climbed. And takeoffs of F-3H Demons. One of the fast F-8U Crusaders making a fine landing. And spotted on the deck all types of Navy carrier-based aircraft. The President observed for the first time landing of aircraft by the new mirror landing system. The mirror supplants the familiar landing signal officer and his colorful gyrations. With this system, the pilot simply keeps a red light, called a meatball, centered in the mirror during his approach and almost automatically makes a perfect landing. Next morning, a Regulus guided missile was prepared for launch by catapult. The President saw FJ-3s using the Sidewinder guided missiles shoot down the Regulus about a thousand feet off the port beam. There was a spectacular demonstration of in-flight refueling. An AJ tanker plane refueled four F-3H demons. The highlight of the day came with the landing of two f 8 Crusaders, which had been launched from the USS Bonhomme Richard off San Diego, California, only three hours and 28 minutes earlier. They flew the ocean-to-ocean -ocean transcontinental flight with but one refueling in midair. The pilots were Captain Robert Doze, USN, Commanding Officer VX-3, and Lieutenant Commander Paul Miller, USN, also of VX-3. It was a happy group on the flight deck as the president congratulated the West Coast group on their historic feat, including the pilots of A3Ds, which also flew over from the Bonhomme Richard. On Friday, 7 June, the Saratoga moored starboard side two at North Pier, U.S. Naval Auxiliary Air Station in Mayport, Florida, and preparations were made for the president's departure. He said before leaving, uh, To Admiral Peary and his staff, and to the officers and men of the United States Saratoga, I want to express my appreciation for the interesting demonstration my colleagues and I have witnessed on your fine ship. The Saratoga looks good. We know, just as you do, that she is good. Our special thanks to all of you for your many courtesies during these few hours we have been able to be with you. Thank you very much and goodbye. Good sailing and to all of you, good luck in the important tasks which are you are performing in defense of our country. In late summer, following the adjournment of Congress, the Navy was host to the President and First Lady for a month's vacation. On 4 September, the Columbine landed at Quonset Point, Rhode Island with the President and Mrs. Eisenhower aboard. This was the start of a long-awaited vacation for the President. On hand to welcome the President and Mrs. Eisenhower was Rhode Island Governor Dennis J. Roberts, Rear Admiral Lester K. Rice, Commander Fleet Air Quonset, and Captain B.E. Close, Commanding Officer of the Naval Air Station. 
After a brief plainside ceremony, during which Governor Roberts presented the President and First Lady with a silver bowl from the citizens of Rhode Island, the party entered waiting limousines for the ride to the Carrier Pier, where they were to board the presidential yacht Barbara Ann. Barbara Ann got underway about 11.40 for the trip across Narragansett Bay to Coasters Harbor Island, where the naval base is situated, and where the summer White House Quarters A was in readiness for them. About a half hour later, the yacht docked at Constellation Landing, Naval Base Newport. The President and First Lady were officially welcomed by the Naval Base Commander, Rear Admiral Henry Cromlin, USN. Leaving the yacht, the First Lady received a bouquet of two dozen carnations from Mrs. Cromlin and posed briefly for photographs before entering a waiting car for the drive to Quarters A. Mrs. Eisenhower was accompanied on the ride by Mrs. Cromlin. After the departure of the First Lady, the President, accompanied by Rear Admiral Cromlin, reboarded the Barbara Ann for the short trip to Government Landing in downtown Newport. Mayor Sullivan welcomed the president to Newport, and then the chief executive and the mayor entered the president's limousine, which had been driven to Newport for the occasion, and led a nine-car motorcade through the narrow streets of Newport to historic Colony House in Washington Square, where the official city reception was to be held. Signs welcoming the president and cheering crowds marked the one-mile route to Colony House, where a stand had been constructed for the reception. dignitaries on the stand to welcome the president were Senators Theodore F. Green and John O. Pastore. Mayor Sullivan made a short speech of welcome and presented the president with a silver bowl and ladle, the city's gift to Mrs. Eisenhower. The president responded, saying in part that both he and Mrs. Eisenhower regretted she could not be present and expressed his appreciation for the friendly welcome given them. He also said that he and the First Lady looked forward to the time of their lives in Newport. Before the President left the stand, he was presented with a 27-pound lobster, which had been caught by the schooner Elizabeth Ann, 60 miles off Block Island, in 400 feet of water. The lobster had been cooked and quick frozen by Councilman George W. Lawton, whose daughter Gay and Miss Grace Downey posed for these pictures with a huge crustacean. Following the civic ceremony, which was completed in 15 minutes, the president re-entered his limousine with Rear Admiral Cromlin for the motor trip to the naval base and the summer White House.
awaiting the arrival of the president at the naval base were hundreds of Navy personnel and their families who stood behind lines of Navy men resplendent in summer whites and the contingent of waves and Marines manning the rail on both sides of the roadway leading from the main gate to base headquarters building. At Dewey Field, the base parade grounds, the president left his car and was piped aboard. Following this traditional Navy honor, the destroyer force band sounded ruffles and flourishes and played hail to the chief. The president then greeted Vice Admiral Ingersoll and other senior flag officers of the area and inspected the Marine Guard. After his inspection, he was introduced to the commanding officers of the naval base. The president then re-entered his waiting limousine for the short ride to the Summer White House to begin his vacation. The next morning, after an early breakfast and an hour in his office, the president went to the Newport Country Club for the first game of golf of his vacation. By 9 a.m., he was on the practice tee, warming up for his match. Still and motion pictures were taken by the news photographers before the game started. Then, with Mr. Howard G. Cushing, Newport Country Club president, Norman Palmer, club professional, and Mr. Haggerty, his press secretary, making up the foursome, the president lined his drive down the first fairway. The Newport Country Club course, one of the oldest in the country, has been known since the first United States amateur tournament was played there in 1895 as one of the finest tests of golfing skill in America. Wind swept and well trapped, the course is a difficult challenge even to the professionals and par players. The president played golf here 23 of the 27 days of his Newport vacation and still maintained a regular working schedule every morning and afternoon in his summer office. The first Sunday of his vacation, the president attended church services at the Red Brick Chapel on the Navy base. Accompanied by the naval aide, Mr. Eisenhower walked the two blocks from his quarters to the chapel for 10.30 Protestant services. After the service, the president posed in front of the chapel with Chaplain Jenkins and four young girl scouts who came to greet him. The girls, Betty Ann Murphy, Barbara Camel, Valerie Wynn, and Dolores Radcliffe, are all daughters of Navy men stationed at the Newport Naval Base. After the photography was completed, the president motored back to the Summer White House. A historic first for President Eisenhower was scheduled on 26 September. The nuclear-powered submarine, Sea Wolf, was anchored off Rose Island, about 2,600 yards southwest of Coasters Harbor Island and the Summer White House. After the completion of his morning golf game, the president, with Dr. Snyder, Mr. Haggerty, and the naval aide, boarded the Barbara Ann for the trip out to the Sea Wolf. The party boarded the submarine directly from the presidential yacht. Full honors were rendered when the president passed between the rows of side boys onto the sea wolf. The president was then greeted by Rear Admiral Frederick B. Warder, Commander Submarines Atlantic, who made the trip from his headquarters in New London for the occasion, and Commander Richard B. Lanning, commanding officer of the boat. Formalities completed, sea wolf was underway and the president and his party proceeded below. The chief executive lunched with the crew. He 
then cut the cake, baked by the sub's galley for us, especially for the occasion. Following lunch, the president made a complete inspection of the atomic submarine while it was underway to the diving area. Sea Wolf submerged at 1.23 p.m. and cruised at periscope depth for 12 minutes before surfacing and returning the president to Newport. Before he left the Sea Wolf, he said, As interested as I've been in all the gadgets and all the new machines, I've been even more interested to see again uh, the U.S. Navy at work. I have been uh, cordially received, and I have been proud of every officer and man I've seen aboard this ship. It's been a memorable experience. I hope to see you again someday. Thank you all for making this trip so pleasant. Twice during his Newport visit, the president interrupted his vacation to return to Washington for vital conferences with government officials. To go from the naval base to the Quonset Naval Air Station across Narragansett Bay, a marine helicopter was used. This was the first occasion on which a president had flown in a Marine Corps aircraft of any kind. Columbine was waiting at the air station for the president. The trip from Newport Naval Base to Washington required but one hour and 46 minutes. On 30 September, the 27-day vacation at Newport came to an end. Before boarding the Barbara Ann, the president said, Well, the time has come for Mrs. Eisenhower and me to say uh, goodbye to the good people of Newport and Rhode Island. We are grateful to all of them and to the native personnel who have been our hosts while here for the cordiality and the hospitality that we've encountered on all sides. Thank each of you for the very fine vacation we have had in this lovely area. Goodbye. Hundreds of Navy men with their families were gathered at the air station to see the President and Mrs. Eisenhower. First Lady went directly to the Columbine from the limousine, while honors were rendered to the chief executive. The president inspected the Quonset Point Marine Honor Guard as the first Naval District Band played songs of the Free Armed Services.